A lot of people don't realize that there's a heck of a lot more to the digestive system than just the intestines. I'm gonna break down how digestion works, but then I'm going to give you the three best foods that are going to help you absorb more nutrients, but I'm also gonna give you the two foods that quite honestly you should probably stay away from that dramatically hinder the absorption of nutrients. I'm not just talking about the food that's absorbed from that specific food, I'm talking about how they can affect the absorption of all the foods that you eat just by raining on your parade and absolutely ruining the party. But first off, let's talk about digestion and how it works. As soon as you consume food, the first thing that starts to happen is your enzymes and your bacteria start to break down food. That's step one, breaking it down into microparticles. But a lot of people think that it just kind of stops there. Well, quite honestly, there's a lot of other involvement. The liver's involved, the pancreas is involved, the kidneys are involved. There's so many other factors that come into play with the digestive system. So once the enzymes and the bacteria start to do the job, the food is now micronized and passes down through into the small intestine. Well, from there, it binds with lots of different emulsifiers and different other enzymes, and it transfers through what is called an enterocyte. Enterocyte is a cell in the wall of the small intestine. That enterocyte acts as a gateway into the bloodstream or into the lymph for the nutrients to actually get to where they need to go. But that's just the mechanical process. You see, there's a lot of other hormone and nervous system things that are going on. So before I give you the best and the worst foods for nutrient absorption, I have to give you a quick crash course in what happens there. You see, we have different regulators, and I'm gonna start with hormone regulators. Because when it comes down to digestion, it's a very big hormonal process, and a lot of us don't give the hormones credit there. There's three hormones in particular that I wanna talk about. The first one is known as gastrin, the second one is known as secretin, and the third one is known as cholecystokinin, or CCK. Okay, gastrin. It's the job of gastrin to have the brain communicate to the gut to start producing stomach acid. Step one when it comes down to digestion. This hormonal response tells the stomach, hey, there's food here, it's time to up the acid content and start breaking this stuff down. The next one that's up is secretin. Now, it's the job of secretin to tell the stomach to start contracting a little bit, but also to start producing pepsin, which helps break down proteins. So that's obviously very, very important. Proteins take a long time to digest, so you wanna start producing pepsin as soon as possible. Then we go into CCK, cholecystokinin. Cholecystokinin tells the pancreas to swell up and produce insulin. What's the job of insulin? To allow the nutrients to get into the cell. So you can see, kind of a trifecta, a three-part series there. Produce stomach acid, start constricting and start producing the enzymes, and then of course, actually absorb the nutrients into the cell the way that we should. Okay, that's the hormonal side of things, but there's actually an entirely separate nervous system regulatory response that happens as well. You see, one form is called the extrinsic nervous system of the digestive system, and this is all the extrinsic nerves that come from the other areas in your body, particularly your brain, to your digestive system. So when you eat something, the nervous system sees the signal and it sends even more electricity, produces acetylcholine and adrenaline. Now, it's the job of the acetylcholine to actually cause the stomach to constrict and cause the intestinal tract to start moving food on through. See, acetylcholine is energy. It's involved in the Krebs cycle, it's involved in all energy production in the cells and in our bodies. So we have acetylcholine coming into the digestive system, it's causing the stimulus of those muscle cells in the digestive system to actually constrict and push food through. Then adrenaline, yeah, the catecholamine that all of us think is just something that makes us wired and amped up, comes into play. And this adrenaline does the opposite of what you think. It actually causes the digestive system to relax. Yeah, believe it or not, adrenaline diverts blood away from the digestive system. So if you've ever been nervous or you've been really excited and you find it hard to eat or you get nauseous, well, that's because adrenaline is making it so that the blood is away from your digestive system. So adrenaline plays a big role in digestion. It causes the stomach to, well, relax. Okay, then we have the intrinsic nervous system that has to do with the gut. This is a large network and a labyrinth of nerves that ultimately end up at our guts and wire a lot of our intestinal tracts. And what ends up happening is whenever we have food in our system, even in our esophagus, it expands and these nerves register that signal. Well, this registration of the signal sends another signal to the brain that says, wait a minute, there's food, we can go ahead and either relax the process or trigger the process as much as we need to. So that's a brief explanation of how the digestive system works. But now, let's get to the fun stuff. Let's get to what you wanna hear. All right, let's start with the foods that you should avoid. And these aren't specific foods, these are more generalized types of foods that you need to avoid. The first one is gonna be phytates, also known as phytic acid and more scientifically known as inositol hexaphosphate. Basically what it is, is it's something that really slows down digestion. And you're gonna find it in almonds, you're gonna find it in a lot of nuts, you're usually gonna find it in the skin or the husk of brown rice. And a lot of times you're gonna find it in wheat too. So anything that's really hard to break down because it has a husk usually has phytic acid in it. Now, 
It's a digestive survival component. So basically it makes it so that if an animal were to eat it, it would be able to survive all the way through digestion, which when you think about it, isn't exactly good for us because we want to absorb our food. Now, this hexaphosphate, what that actually stands for is the fact that it has six phosphate molecules. Now, when you have something that has that many phosphate molecules it is what is known as a very highly charged particle. Now, when you have six phosphorus molecules like that, each time a phosphorus is cleaved off, you're producing a lot of energy. That high abundance of energy, that causes it to chelate different minerals and different metals in the body. So what does that mean for you? It means all the minerals like the magnesium and the phosphorus and all the iron, and everything that you're trying to absorb is getting chelated in the gut and not getting absorbed well. But to add insult to injury, the phytic acid is also an amylase inhibitor and also a pepsin inhibitor, which means it's gonna slow down the digestion of starches and it's gonna slow down the digestion of proteins. So it's not just the phytic acid itself that's hard to digest, it's making it hard to digest other food too. Next up is lectins, which I recently did a video on. Lectins you're gonna find in beans and you're gonna find a lot in wheat. Now here's the thing with lectins. They're only bad if you really have them in excess, but if you have them in excess, they will really cramp your style, no pun intended. Basically, the particles in lectins are so darn big that they don't absorb very well, they don't break down. So what do they do? They run through your intestinal tract like a bowling ball, destroying your villi. Your villi is what actually absorbs nutrients. And when those villi are destroyed, well, what do you have to absorb nutrients? You just get these big old particles that are barely making it through into the bloodstream, undigested, causing all kinds of damage and autoimmune issues. So in short, you wanna make sure you cook your beans all the way and that you're not going crazy on them. Okay, so that's enough of that. Let's get into the best foods that you can eat that are gonna help you absorb more nutrients. The first one is coconut oil. And I'm not just saying this because coconut oil is healthy, okay? Sure, coconut oil has lauric acid, it has monolaurin, that's great. It's gonna help you digest, it's gonna help you put good bacteria back in your gut. But is it gonna help you absorb other nutrients? Yes, it will. In fact, there was a study published in the Journal of Agriculture and Food Chemistry that found compared to polyunsaturated fats, coconut oil increased the absorption of carotenoids that were found in tomatoes dramatically more. And the reason behind this is generally because of the medium chain triglycerides, the MCTs. See that coconut oil absorbs a lot easier and it doesn't have to go through the liver for digestion, which means fat soluble vitamins will bind to the MCTs and get carried into the bloodstream a lot easier, meaning you're absorbing more nutrients and absorbing more vitamins when you're consuming it with coconut oil versus a polyunsaturated fat. Okay, so we know coconut oil is good. What about the other ones? Prebiotic and probiotic combinations of foods. We're talking about a symbiotic relationship here. We're not just taking probiotic foods and we're not just taking prebiotic foods, we're trying to combine them. So what does this look like? Well, it looks like combining things like a little bit of yogurt, a little maybe a little bit of sauerkraut, and a prebiotic fiber like asparagus. You see, prebiotics grow existing bacteria in the gut, probiotics add new bacteria in. So when you think about it, you combine the two, you've got a happy marriage. You're adding new bacteria in, and then you're fertilizing it with something like asparagus that's a prebiotic fiber. So the trick is to combine those things. It may sound crazy, but putting asparagus on a burger with a little bit of sauerkraut actually tastes pretty good, especially if you slice the asparagus really thin. Anyway, I digress. That's just a personal recipe of mine. Now lastly is bone broth. I'm always talking about bone broth. I'm a huge personal fan of it. And the reason is when it comes down to nutrient absorption, it is something that's called a hydrophilic colloid. Now, sounds fancy, but all it means is that bone broth is gonna allow the gastric juices to stay in the gut a lot more. When you retain a lot more of the gastric juices and a lot more of the water in your gut, it not only makes it so you have a healthier immune system and a healthier gut digestive process, but you're actually able to absorb more nutrients in the first place. See, those gastric juices are what contain all the enzymes and contain all the bacteria that you need. So if you have those juices retained in the colon where they should be, it's gonna make it that much easier for the small intestine to do its job and transfer nutrients into the bloodstream. Now, as always, I'm a big fan of Kettle and Fire Bone Broth. I work with them closely. I've helped them with product development and I'm a good friend with their owner. So you can always take advantage of my exclusive price on Kettle and Fire. The purpose of this video isn't just to tout a product, it's to talk about all the different things that you can do to start benefiting your immune system, benefiting your gut, and getting the most and the best digestion that you possibly can. So remember, avoid the lectins, Limit the phytic acid, roast those almonds, and get them without the skin whenever possible. Blanched is better. And try to get as much of the coconut oil, the prebiotic and probiotic foods, as well as bone broth as you possibly can. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel, and I will see you in the next video.